Good morning. Welcome to worship with us here at La Crescenta Presbyterian Church. And a special welcome if you're joining us here for the first time. We hope your spirit will be lifted, drawing closer to God this hour as we sing his praise, listen to the reading of his word, and receive instruction in the paths of righteousness. Let's go to God with a quick prayer. Gracious, loving God, we bow before you, seeking your grace this morning. Be with each of us as we worship you this hour. The psalmist says, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. Let's do just that. We're so glad you're with us in worship today. If you're new or you have new contact information, please fill out one of the white get in touch cards that are in the pew racks and put it in the offering plate or stop by our connection center in the narthex. We'd love to meet you. If you'd like to receive our weekly email and find out about everything going on at LCPC, you can sign up on the homepage of our website at lcpc.net call the church office, or scan the QR code on the screen. Santa Claus is coming to town, and he has a special mailbox in front of the church this year. It's near the sidewalk just west of the sanctuary entrance, and anybody can leave a note for Santa inside. Be sure to include a return address and drop your letter off tomorrow, December 19th, in order to receive a reply from Santa. Christmas is one week away. This year, LCPC will have three opportunities to celebrate the birth of Christ. 
two on Christmas Eve and one on Christmas Day. On Christmas Eve at 5 p.m., our contemporary praise band, The Blessed, will lead a fun, upbeat worship service focused on how Jesus meets us in times of need or pain. Then at 7 p.m., the LCPC Choir will lead a traditional Lessons and Carols service with candlelight worship. Both services will feature a petting zoo in front of the church. Finally, join us on Christmas Day at 10 a.m. in the chapel for a casual Christmas service. Our children's ministry director, Josiah Bozik, will lead this family-oriented service full of carols and fun. That's it for this week. Now let's continue with worship. Yeah. 
Will you please join me in our prayer of confession? Almighty Father, forgive our sins. Forgive the sins that we remember and the sins that we have forgotten. Forgive our many failures in the face of temptation and those times when we have been stubborn in the face of correction. Forgive the times we have been proud of our own achievements and those when we have failed to boast in your works. Forgive the harsh judgments we have made of others and the leniency we have shown ourselves. Forgive the lies we have told to others and the truths we have avoided. Forgive us the pain we have caused others and the indulgence we have shown ourselves. Father, have mercy on us and make us whole for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to worship. My name is Laura Harbert. I am Mike Harbert's wife, and I'm really honored and privileged to be delivering the sermon to you this morning. We are in the tail end of our Advent series, and Mike began this series with his sermon on Zechariah, and then he also looked at the story and the role of Joseph in the Advent story, and then last week we looked at the story of the Magi. And today we're going to be receiving lessons from Mary and look at what Mary has to teach us about the beautiful lessons of Advent. So please hear the word of God now as I read you our scripture for this morning from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Loving and almighty God, as we reflect this morning together on this amazing passage of scripture, on this amazing young woman, and on the incredible journey that began as that angel came to her and announced this amazing, unbelievable news. So God, open our hearts anew to this passage that we've heard so many times. May your spirit speak to us this morning a fresh word, a new word, about what it is you want us to hear as we reflect together on the story about Mary. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I sat down a few weeks ago to begin my study for this sermon on Mary, I couldn't help but remember my one and only Christmas pageant that I have ever been in. I was not raised in the church, so I didn't get the chance as a little girl to be a donkey or a lamb or a shepherd. But when I was 31 years old, I was asked to be Mary in the Christmas pageant at the First Presbyterian Church of Evanston. And I was chosen not because I was on staff at the time or that there was anything particularly blessed or holy about me, but I had had a baby myself six months earlier. 
And at First Presbyterian Evanston, they did not mess around with a baby doll in the Christmas pageant. They had a real live baby. So they had a woman who had a five or six month old baby be Mary and then her little infant because it fit perfectly in the manger, a five or six month old fit in the manger that had been built years before and was the centerpiece of the Christmas pageant. So I had had months to get ready. I even had to sing a little bit of the Magnificat, which is what I was most nervous about. I'd practiced my lines. The morning uh, of Christmas Eve morning, we had a dress rehearsal, everything went great. My three-year-old son, Grant, had also been conscripted into the Christmas pageant as a manger angel. He and about five or six little preschoolers wore adorable white choir robes and a silver wreath made of scratchy, itchy tinsel, which will come into the story in a minute. And he, they were supposed to hover around the manger adoring the baby Jesus. Well, you'd think being a psychologist, I maybe should have thought a little bit about this, that this three-year-old was pretty tired of adoring his brand new baby sister the last six months. And lo and behold, as the Christmas pageant is beginning, the Holy Family is there at the manger, the manger angels come out and are supposed to start circling the manger, adoring the baby Jesus. He sees the baby Jesus' sister in the manger and has none of it. The first thing he did, he rips his halo off encouraging all the other manger angels to rip their halos off. And then he began opening the presents. There were these beautifully wrapped boxes that were all around the manger that were part of the decoration and to symbolize the, the gifts brought to the Christ child. And my son Grant, who was no longer a manger angel but became a little manger devil, started opening the presents. And as you can imagine, they were empty boxes that were wrapped beautifully. And a three-year-old that unwraps an empty box, it, it's something horrible in their mind that they can't even understand. Where is the toy? This is an empty box. So all the kids are opening boxes. The whole Christmas pageant is now up for grabs. People are hilariously laughing. I still get Christmas cards to this day from people who were there remembering the Christmas pageant fiasco. I was trying desperately to stay in the role of the Blessed Mother while I was giving my three-year-old son the evil eye. He knew I had no power to stop him. It was just a night. It was a nightmare. But it was, as I look back on it now, it's one of those stories that we often tell at Christmas time and can laugh a lot about it now. My other main association with Mary, as I begin thinking about what I want to say this morning, is that I attended a Catholic school growing up. I was, as I said, from a non-religious family, and I became a Christian while I was in high school through the Ministry of Young Life. And I began very quickly to realize that Protestants and Catholics had a very different view of Mary. At my Catholic school, uh, there was a focus on Mary all throughout the year. There were prayers to Mary. There was a theology of Mary that Mary had been born without original sin, that Mary was assumed after her death into heaven. There was a lot of focus on Mary. In my Presbyterian church, where I began attending after becoming a Christian, Mary was never mentioned except in Advent. And there was actually, I think, a lot of maybe pushback or baggage of uh, reacting to the Catholic view of Mary, not wanting in any way to have Mary compete with Jesus. But what I feel today is I think if we could get past our theological differences about Mary, and recognize that Mary is a big deal. Mary is the mother of God. And if there's one thing I know about mothers from my role as a psychologist, mothers are important. Mothers are really important. And if somehow in this unfathomable mystery of the incarnation, that somehow Jesus was actually fully God, as it says in the Gospel of John that the, he was the Word, and the Word was with God, and Jesus was there at the beginning of all creation, that Jesus was fully God, member of the Trinity. And yet, what we're celebrating at this time of year is that Jesus was born in human flesh. God was somehow surrendered. The majesty of heaven came down, as it says in Philippians, humbled himself, became a human being, and Jesus was also fully human. I think it's a lot more difficult for us to understand that part of Jesus, the fully human aspect of Jesus. But if what we say we believe is true, then fully human Jesus was loved into loving the way we all are by his mother. You know that when a baby is born, their range of vision is exactly the space between the crook 
of a mother's arm and her eyes. And the gazing, the loving gazing that goes on between a mother and an infant is literally shaping that infant's brain to love. The baby looks into a mother's eyes and sees that love and begins to understand what love is and comes alive. In that loving gaze, if you could map the brains of the infant and the mother, all parts of their brains light up when they're in that moment of loving, gazing connection. So somehow Mary helped God, who is love, learn to love. So what do we see in our passage of scripture that helps us understand more about this amazing person who God chose to be the mother of Jesus? I want to acknowledge and I want to express my gratitude to Richard Rohr and Barbara Brown Taylor for a lot of my thoughts and reflections that I have this morning. Their writings, their sermons about Mary have influenced me this morning a lot. I want to acknowledge that. Richard Rohr talks about the fact that so often in Scripture, when people are called upon to great tasks, you think in the Bible, you think of Moses, Gideon, Isaiah, what's their response? They often say something like, who am I, Lord? Send my brother. I'm not worthy. There's often an expression of unworthiness that accompanies this call by God, as if they're focused on their own efforts to become something or do something that would allow them to deserve this special assignment from God. I think we often feel that we need to earn or deserve God's attention by some quality or some effort that we have generated ourselves. But the angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you have found favor with God. Favor, grace, mercy, undeserved love. You are favored. And Mary doesn't protest that she isn't worthy of this attention. She's perplexed. I think the scripture passage said troubled, but other translations say she was perplexed. She doesn't have any idea how to make sense of what the angel is telling her. She's experiencing what author and pastor Debbie Thomas call holy bewilderment. Her encounter with the angel doesn't lead her to focus on her own worthiness or unworthiness. It doesn't lead her out of doubt into some rock-solid faith. But Mary is moved out of certainty, out of the way that she had always imagined her life to be, always imagined God to be. She's moved out of that certainty and into holy bewilderment. What is happening to me? What is going on? What is God doing? How can this be? Has God ever ripped into your life in a way that was completely unexpected and maybe even unwanted? Have you ever asked Mary's question of how can it be? How can it be that I'm going through a divorce? How can it be that I found love after all these years of being alone? How can it be that my child has that diagnosis? How can it be that I'm being called into ministry? How can it be? We're going to experience things as we live this adventure of life that are more wonderful and more terrifying and more tragic than we ever could have imagined our life to be. Living a life of intimacy with God is not a safe life. It is not a life that will unfold according to our expectations or our efforts. It's a thrilling and a dangerous story that we become a part of when we say yes to God. Mary consents to this holy bewilderment. She consents to wonder and to stretch and to serve a God who dwells in mystery. She chooses to accept, to say yes to what she can't control and she sure doesn't understand. That's Mary's choice. The angel doesn't give her the choice of whether this is going to happen or not. The angel doesn't ask her permission for the Messiah to be woven together in her womb. But Mary does have a choice. 
Will she be a willing participant in this holy disruption? Will she say, yes, I will live the life that's being held out to me? Or will I say no? No, I don't want to welcome this unwelcome thing. I don't want to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit, whatever that means. I will fight this or deny this. I will spend my energy trying to ignore this disruption and get back to life as I planned it. And if my efforts don't make this go away, I will become angry or bitter or resentful that my life didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. Did you ever read the book Great Expectations by Charles Dickens? There's a memorable character, Miss Havisham, who was a wealthy spinster who gets jilted at the altar, and she insists on wearing her wedding dress for the rest of her life and living in her ruined mansion with the wedding cake and the wedding breakfast left on the table, never eaten, decaying and rotting. She refused to say yes to any other life than the one that she had wanted and expected. And when that life got blown up by a groom that never showed up at the church, her life stopped right there and stagnated and rotted, and she died a little bit every day. Think of all the times that God may have come to you in different forms and issued invitations to become a part of this bigger, riskier, thrilling adventure of life in the kingdom of God. And we've said no. No, I'm afraid. No, I'm too busy. No, I can't accept this. No, it's not fair. No, I'm not worthy. Think of the reasons Mary could have said no. I'm afraid Joseph will leave me. I'm afraid I'll bring so much shame on my parents that they won't love me anymore. I'm afraid my friends won't believe me or stand by me. I'm only 14. How am I going to be the mother to the Son of God? But instead, Mary sat with her holy bewilderment, all the mystery, all the unknowns, and she said yes. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. Yes, I will take part in a plan that I didn't choose. And even though I am perplexed and I am afraid, God, you say that you will be with me and that nothing is impossible with you. I will trust you even as I have so many questions. And we know that this yes came with a great cost. Mary was surely scorned and shamed in her community for being pregnant before marriage. Mary knew the pain of becoming a refugee that fled her country to protect the life of her child. Mary suffered deeply as she watched her precious son step into his calling as Messiah and watched the hostility and the fear and the hatred grow around him from the religious authorities. And she finally watched him be tortured and crucified. So this yes was costly and dangerous, and yet she lived her life knowing that she was highly favored, that God was with her, and that she had played a unique and essential role in bringing God's love and God's salvation to the entire world. So here's the question I want to leave you with this morning. In what ways do you feel God possibly asking you to bear God into the world through your life, through your creativity, through your work, through your love? How are you carrying God into your world? Have you said yes to God's invitation to become a part of this larger story? Or have you crafted a life that is safely within your control, according to your expectations, based on what you've produced and what you've designed? May we let the exquisite, terrible humility of Mary, her holy bewilderment, inspire us this morning 
to open our hearts and our minds beyond what we can understand and say yes to God's crazy plans that don't make sense to us so often. May we this Christmas say, God, Emmanuel, come. Come in ways we don't expect. Come in ways that you know we need. Break open our imaginations and give us courage and humility to take those steps of yes and let you do amazing things in and through our lives. So brothers and sisters of La Crescenta Presbyterian Church, do not be afraid. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you and nothing is impossible with God. Amen. Thanks again for joining us in worship this morning. We trust this hour has been a blessing to you. As we prepare to take God's light into the world, we'd like to invite you to join our congregation in person Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock in our beautiful sanctuary, where our terrific praise band leads the music, or in our chapel, where we sing the great hymns of the faith led by our choir. If you're feeling disconnected from the church, especially if you aren't able to leave home, please call or email Nancy in the office and we'll have one of our caring deacons reach out to you. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Thank you.